Thus, the away carry-on was born. The approach is simple. Create special objects that are designed to be resilient, resourceful, and essential to the way you travel today. They ask thousands of people how they pack, why they travel, and what bugs them most about their luggage, then designed a bag that solved a few old problems, like sticky wheels, and a few new ones, like dead cell phones. Away uses high-quality materials while offering a much lower price compared to other brands by cutting out the middleman and selling directly to you. Choose from nine colors and four sizes, the carry-on, the bigger carry-on, the medium, or the large. I got the bigger carry-on in green, and it's a nice dark army green that is right on target with War Baby's brand. I mostly travel for the podcast, so I love to just take a carry-on and be on my way. The Away Bigger Carry-On with Battery is absolutely what I need to make my travels easier. And it's unbelievably lightweight. You won't believe it. All suitcases made with premium German polycarbonate, unrivaled in strength and impact resistance. Carry-on sizes are compliant with all major U.S. airlines while maximizing the amount you can pack. Four 360-degree spinner wheels guarantee a smooth ride, while the TSA-approved combination lock built into the top of the bag prevents theft. Never worry about your stuff again. Both sides of the carry-on are able to charge all cell phones and anything else that's powered by a USB cord. A single charge of the Away carry-on will charge your iPhone five times. There's a lifetime warranty and a 100-day trial. Live with it, vibe with it, travel with it, Instagram it. If at any point you decide it's not for you, return it for a full refund. No questions asked. For $20 off a suitcase, visit awaytravel.com forward slash warbaby and use promo code warbaby during checkout. Free shipping on any away order within the lower 48 states. Visit away.com forward slash warbaby and use promo code warbaby during checkout for $20 off a suitcase and get ready to live that away lifestyle. Equally devastating in the same and different ways are cases of accidental self-inflicted gunshot deaths by children. Whose gun was it? How did the child get it? Who will be blamed? All of this plus trying to grieve a young life taken abruptly. Over the last year, several children have died in this manner. Avoidable, preventable deaths. For instance, around 11.45 p.m. on May 26, 2018, police near Salt Lake City were called to a unit at 2782 South Fair Isle Lane in West Valley City, Utah, for a report of shots fired. The caller, 27-year-old Tasman Mile, had a fairly extensive criminal past, as well as two children. He was described as a loving father and husband, and on this night, he had laid down cuddled with his two- and seven-year-old sons and went to sleep, their mother out of town. Within arm's reach, a loaded Walther CCP handgun. The young father was startled awake by the sound of the firearm discharging, and soon realized that his two-year-old son, Tevita Punyani Maile, had shot himself in the head. A neighbor heard a loud thud and called 911. She then looked out the window, reporting to police that she saw Tasman Maile holding his older son's hand and a blue bucket in the other. He was covered in blood, and the pair ran to the community dumpster and chucked the blue bucket in. When police arrived, he admitted to doing so, and they were able to quickly recover the evidence. Inside the dumpster, they found the bucket, inside of which was 10 ounces of marijuana and a digital scale, along with a backpack. Inside the backpack was the case for the Walther pistol and its clip, along with a 9mm in a case, and another 9mm in a holster. The guilty handgun itself still lay on the master bedroom floor where the three had lain. Mother Valerie Maile was out of town and Punyani's father Tasman was arrested for child abuse homicide as well as three counts of possession of a firearm by a restricted person, drug possession with intent to distribute, and obstruction of justice for the trip to the dumpster. He faced 22 years in prison. Tasman had multiple prior convictions, mostly misdemeanors, including multiple DUIs. In 2011, he was convicted of interfering with an arresting officer. In 2016, he fled the scene of an accident after hitting a parked cop car working a different scene. 
Two-year-old Punyani passed away three days later. As part of a large, close-knit Tongan family, some members, including his grandmother, were in New Zealand visiting his great-grandmother. The toddler remained on life support until his family could convene and for donation of his organs. Two months later, in July of 2018, Tasman accepted a plea deal and pleaded guilty to the reduced charge of negligent homicide, as well as obstructing justice, drug distribution, and the three counts of illegal possession of a firearm. The sentencing hearing found a man reflective of his actions and their consequences, saying through tears, I'm just at a state right now where I can't even function. All I want to do is just see my son one last time. He apologized to his wife, family, and the state of Utah for what he referred to as his careless actions. Tasman's defense attorney requested no prison time from the judge, saying the father had reformed his life in the months since his son was killed. He was attending counseling, and he and his wife Valerie had even opened a business and named it after their beloved youngest son. Valerie Miley told the judge that Tasman was a great father and husband who loved his children. She, too, requesting he be spared prison, further forced separation. Judge Shaughnessy agreed that no amount of prison time could punish this father as much as he had already punished himself. The judge suspended all 22 years of prison and sentenced Tasman Miley to 90 days in jail, with a credit for 10 days he'd already served. Now, just as Tasman Miley was entering his guilty plea last July... A terribly bloody weekend for toddler shootings took place, the weekend following Independence Day. It seemed like a normal holiday weekend, last Saturday, July 7th. In Augusta, Georgia, at the Millbrook Point Apartments, the Foss family were all at home that morning. 27-year-old Justin Foss Sr., his wife, 24-year-old Shelby Foss and their four-year-old son, little red-headed Justin Foss Jr., who preferred to go by J.J. The Saturday morning calm was abruptly shattered when around 10.45 a.m., four-year-old J.J. found a loaded Smith & Wesson underneath the couch and shot himself in the head. The transcript of the frantic 911 call made by Shelby Foss is rife with emotion. Father told son to look at daddy and to please don't die. Mother telling him to breathe and begging the dispatcher for an ambulance between brief explanations of the events that had transpired. The boy was still alive, but soon passed away. His father, Justin Sr., was arrested then and charged with first-degree murder, second-degree murder, child cruelty, and possession of a firearm by a felon. As it turns out... Justin Sr. should not have been in possession of any firearms, as he had been a felon since the age of 20. Formerly of Greer, South Carolina, it seems that in 2012, he met a 16-year-old girl on Facebook. He was 20. He would end up taking a plea deal for attempted murder after tying up the girl's mother and stabbing her stepfather and trying to slit his throat. Everyone survived, and he received probation. 2013 saw a strong armed robbery conviction, and 2015 another charge for armed robbery. He then moved to Georgia. The following Tuesday, Justin Foss Sr. was indicted, as was Shelby Foss, on two charges, second-degree murder and child cruelty. She had no previous criminal record, and the following month was granted $200,000 bond with the stipulation that she have no contact with her husband or their daughter. Justin Sr. was denied bond due to his extensively violent criminal background. Neither parent was able to attend J.J.'s funeral. The couple's trial just began this previous Monday, April 29th, and I will update this case when it concludes. Now I know this is going to shock you, but a very similar shooting took place the very same day, and the very next day as well, but I'm skipping ahead. Late that same Saturday morning, July 7th, 2018, Jonathan Alexander left his Fresno, California home and went to work, leaving his 2-year-old son in the care of his 22-year-old fiancée, Jenna. 
Their 35-year-old roommate, Oscar Ramos, was also home. Jenna fed Jace a late breakfast and parked him in front of the television, a normal Saturday routine for kids the world over. Jenna told police she then retreated to the master bedroom to play video games behind closed doors for what she recollected was about a half an hour. At some point, Oscar came in to talk to her and the pair were only snapped back to reality when the telltale sounds of a gunshot rang out. Two-year-old Jace Alexander had shot himself in the head with his father's roommate's unsecured Sig Sauer semi-automatic pistol. Jonathan Alexander had warned Oscar on multiple occasions, including earlier that very same week, to secure his firearm in the gun safe he had in his bedroom. Jonathan had found the handgun laying out on a dresser and warned the man to keep the gun away from the access of his children. Once Oscar and Jenna found Jason a pool of blood on his bedroom floor, they saw the gun right near him on the bed. Jenna was unable to connect to 911 and reported to police that Oscar Ramos inexplicably paced nervously for 5 to 10 minutes before Jenna took his phone, placing the potentially life-saving phone call. It was 12.45 p.m. At first, he told police that he had last seen his gun the night before on top of the living room entertainment center. He later admitted that he had no idea where he had left it or where Jace had retrieved it from. Just before 3 p.m., Jace was pronounced dead at the hospital. Jace's two older siblings immediately missed his giant warm hugs and ever-present smile. The parents shared custody of the kids and Jace's mother had picked up the older children the day before, leaving Jace to spend one more day at his dad's house. California law requires that guns be kept in a locking device, like a safe or gun box, with conviction for a failure to do so punishable by up to three years incarceration. Oscar Ramos was charged with criminal storage of a firearm and possession of high-capacity magazines. Inside that locked gun safe in his bedroom, where that Sig Sauer should have been, Police found ammunition and those high-capacity magazines able to hold up to 10 cartridges. He took full responsibility for Jace's death but pleaded not guilty. Although I couldn't find his ultimate sentence, he had no prior criminal history and attorneys involved foresaw probation and no jail time as a likely sentence. As if that weekend hadn't already been deadly enough, the very next day, a nearly identical shooting took place in Houston, Texas. On Sunday, July 8, 2018, two-year-old Christopher Williams Jr. was home with both of his parents in northwest Houston. About 1 p.m., Jr. picked up a 9mm handgun left on the couch by his father, 35-year-old Christopher Williams Sr., The toddler pointed it at his head and fired. Police responded and found the boy's father distraught and short of breath. He kept screaming out that this was his son. Christopher Sr., the owner of the gun, had prior felony convictions dating back almost 20 years. His record included charges for evading arrest, drug possession, and a 2009 conviction for possession of a firearm by a felon. Just a week ago, on April 22, 2019, Christopher Williams Sr. was arrested and charged with a misdemeanor charge of firearm accessible to a child. I'll also update this case, if and when I can. Two other shootings involving toddlers took place within days of these last July. Those toddlers lived. The same Saturday that Jace Alexander and J.J. Foss shot themselves, The four-year-old son of Heather Odom and Jeremy Barrett got a hold of a loaded thirty-eight caliber handgun from his mother's purse. The family was staying at the Ocean's One Resort in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and both parents were in a different room of their suite when Isaiah Odom Barrett shot himself in the head. The bullet entered his forehead between his eyes and exited through the crown. He was last listed in critical condition. Both parents were charged with child neglect and were released on their own recognizance so they could be with their son if his condition worsened. 
Then, three days later, on July 10, 2018, the same day that Shelby and Justin Foss Sr. were indicted, and only two 